Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, <laughs> this is our first series of interviews to a select group, or group of scholars and artists uh, in relation to a class that I am co-teaching with Elika Ortega Guzman. If you say something, you'll be in camera, Elika. Hello. <laughs> um, and we are going to be introducing today uh, Leonardo Flores, as our first speaker, we will be having a conversation with him uh, about different matters related to the class. If you want more information, you can read our class description uh, in this website. So Professor uh, Leonardo Flores is chair of the English department at Appalachian State University. He taught at the English department at University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez campus from 1994 to 2019. He's also president of the Electronic Literature Organization. He was also the 2012 to 2013 Fulbright Scholar in Digital Culture at the University of Bergen in Norway. His research areas are electronic literature and its preservation via criticism, documentation, and digital archives. He's also the creator of a scholarly blogging project titled I Love E-Poetry, co-editor of the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 3, and has the Spanish language ELIT column in 80, 80 grados. He is currently co-editing the first anthology of Latin American electronic literature. And if you want to know more about the many, many things that Leo does, you can visit his website at leonardoflores.net. Uh, I think Elika will start this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Leo, so much for agreeing to talk to us. It's really just really wonderful to have to have you particularly come to this class. Thank you um, for the invitation. Yeah, of course. Um, so we have uh, a few questions that we'd like to ask you. Surely we're going to take some details and that's totally fine, uh, but we'll get started. So this week we're really focusing on the basis of electronic literature. However, as uh, you can tell from the title and from the description of our course, we're really not staying with the term electronic literature. And there's several reasons for that, that you know, we can discuss in a minute. But we're going with the term digital literary arts. Um, so I guess the, the first question that I have for you uh, first is, you know, what do you consider to be electronic literature? How, what is electronic literature? And then if you could talk a little bit about the different denominations that tend to exist between electronic literature, digital literature, digital literary arts, uh, et cetera. What are the differences? What are the stakes in that kind of discussion? All right. Well, let's see. Um, let's start with literature. Let's get foundational there. If we think about what is literature, we're thinking about the art of language or the art of writing. Uh, Walter J. Ong, a theorist on orality, published a famous book called Orality and Literary, Literacy the technologizing of the word, himself rejected the idea of oral literature. Uh, orality is pre-literary. Literary is writing. So if we think of poetry, right? Poetry is a technology for memory, as Ong theorized. And of course, it is written down. And, and for the past few thousand years, uh, Poetry has survived in both oral form, but also in written form. And that is how it gets published and circulates. Uh, though now we have YouTube, for instance. Uh, but using the technology of, of writing and, and print, uh, poetry was able to circulate. Narrative starts orally, really develops uh, in, in writing. Uh, and, and so the novel, for example, is a fairly it's called novel and it means new, right? And it's a fairly recent, as in just a few centuries old recent literary form. Mm -hmm. So what we understand as literature was shaped by the technology of writing on the page, laying ink on paper, whether it's through pens and different kinds of writing implements or keyboards or, uh, you know, typewriters and really the technology of print for mass producing uh, formats like the book that can circulate. So our very notion of literature is based on concepts of artistic writing, right? So it's, it's writing that tries, it's the art of words and the art of writing. Now, what happens when you start adding electronic to it? Well, 
the ele electronic media predates digital media and therefore became a first space where we started to see things like video poetry. So video poetry then incorporates writing mm. into material that's saved on electromagnetic tape and produced on electromagnetic tape. That is the writing surface of sorts, right? Uh, using some sort of studio and interfaces, right? Similar to film, but this is where we start to begin to get writing that transcends the page. Uh, for instance, uh, Eduardo Cac wrote a piece called Now, in which he is using LED uh, language projectors, you know, these scrollers. And that was an mm -hmm. electronic pre-digital technology. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason we talk about electronic literature is because there's some early predecessor forms, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the digital requires electricity and therefore we could say is electronic, but electronic is a sort of large umbrella term. But then there's also a kind of historical thing. Back in the 90s, when things were going digital, everything was electronic this and electronic that. Email, for example, mm -hmm. electronic mail. So at the time, e-poetry, e-literature, electronic literature, it served as a way to mm -hmm. kind of bridge conceptually from the old concept of literature to then the new digital concept, electronic. And it, it's really more of a cultural association with it. Even then, there were debates. I mean, even 20 years ago, when, when, when things were kind of solidifying into electronic literature, there were debates about why not, why not digital literature. And mm -hmm. part of it is because it was catchy at the time. And part of it is because there are some important electronic predecessors. Right. So, and, and, and then to kind of come to the terms that you are proposing now, which I think are a lot more current, uh, digital literary arts, is that what you, is that it the is. term? Mm -hmm. what, what's interesting here is that digital media allows us to bring in audio, video, visual information, text, uh, programming, all kinds of materials that we can then bring together, right? And, and so electronic literature has a lot of intermedia or multimedia or multimodal elements. It is frequently, because digital media makes it so easy, we're writing on images, we're writing next to or around images, we're writing on video in time and space. So all these arts begin to converge and, and therefore to just think of it as the literary is a little bit limiting, right? And, and so, so it comes, we come back around to the question, if there's all these arts that are digital and they're all coming together, for example, video games have a lot of interactivity, narrative, all kinds of things, then why consider it literary? Or what is the literary interest in these pieces, right? So for example, there are a lot of wonderful video games that tell stories, but maybe have no writing. There's no mm -hmm. language in it. Uh, or, I mean, it's, it's not legible to the player reader it is in the code, right? And there may be a literary element down there in the code, but the experience that people are having are not literary aesthetic experiences. They're not engagements with language. And therefore, I think, even though they may be very literary, right, in their qualities, they're not literature in the sense that there's not, it's not provoking an aesthetic experience through language. Right. So, I, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to intersect because I think this is a good sort of way to go into our next question that has a lot to do with this ways of reading, you know, thinking that a sort of dominant approach to this uh, works that you're talking about has been a formalist approach, right? Establishing mm -hmm. genres, modalities, rhetorical figures, 
uh, even generations. And so why, why is that? Uh, why, why, what's the importance of thinking uh, about this works from a materialist perspective as well? Well, this belies a little bit of my own formation. I'm a formalist at heart. I'm fascinated by how the materials we're working with um, shape, right, the form. And, and in my own, before discovering electronic literature, I did research on comics. And I was really fascinated by the language of comics and how text and image can coexist, image and image work together to communicate with one another. I, I, I also am fascinated by film and the language of film. So I think it's important at a foundational level to understand things from a formal and even pushing formalism kind of beyond formalism into media studies and platform studies to see what are the affordances. So, so it's not like mm -hmm. the old fashioned formalism uh, it's a sort of updated formalism that's really looking at platform media uh, and, 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 and then how that radiates into cultural context as well. So, for instance, from a formal point of view, uh, an image macro meme, right, text placed over an image was very possible and was actually done in the print era. Right. It's, 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 you know, magazines, ads, mm -hmm. put language over images yeah. and, and create these multimodal compositions really well. There's nothing particularly new from a formal point of view with memes. However, the fact that they circulate massively in social media networks, that they evolve, that they are, I mean, you can almost tell a narrative of a meme as it explodes into variations, reaches a certain kind of meta level, right? As it starts to decline in popularity, it starts to mash up with other memes and eventually becomes passe and forgotten, right? But there's that kind of life cycle to a meme that is entirely different from what would happen, say, in a, in a magazine uh, publication. And therefore, it is very much a digital object. It is very much, I think, e-literature. Uh, and there, and when we start to bring in the, the question of the literary, think about the compression that you have to have with language when all you have is a little bit of text up top and a little bit of text in the bottom or in a caption mm -hmm. over the image or maybe a little balloon or something, right? More comics-like. But if all you have, I mean, is, is just those two phrases, and sometimes one of them is already constrained, right? It, 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 there's already half the phrase has been written for you. You're really talking about a level of compression, of language compression, that's equivalent to a haiku, to that's equivalent to a couplet, right? These are, uh, in many cases, uh, using the poetic function of language in a, in a powerful way. So formalism, yes, but we need to kind of go beyond formalism and update it. Excellent. Uh, this really dovetails very well into the next question, which is uh, we're insisting uh, very much on the importance and the cultural significance of studying flash-based works this year like this, you know, the fall of 2020, not 2019, I wish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what year is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what did you think comes after December 30, 31st, 2020 for all the Flash-based works? flash Magadan. I know. <laughs> it's coming. The end is coming. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me how Flash really inspired a whole generation of people to to create interactive multimedia even generative pieces i mean so many folks i mean it it made the the bar to access available accessible to people there was still a learning curve it was not a simple program to use 
but it was simple enough that someone who was motivated could learn how to use it and create really sophisticated things uh, right away. And I would say to this day, we still don't have as powerful a development environment as Flash and as user-friendly as Flash. And we have other things, right? We, we have things like Twine, for instance, which is really kind of, again, lowers the bar in terms of web development and, and all these things. And you can do something simple or you can really push it to do something really sophisticated. But the kind of multimedia integration and, and interactivity and just taking all those resources and getting them to work together powerfully uh, I, I think is still unparalleled, uh, at least at the technical level that's needed. Now, if you're a super programmer and developer for iOS or whatever, sure, you can do all those things. But getting average people to be able to learn a piece of software and create really cool stuff, Flash was it. And, and I will mourn the passing of Flash, and I think it's really important that we enjoy and celebrate the Flash works that, that remain uh, while we have access to them. And let's hope uh, we, we or the community are able to find some good solutions to mm -hmm. access. Yeah, that certainly. Level. It feels yeah, to I'm, me, it feels a little bit, I'm sorry, Alex, it feels a little bit like, you know, watching the moon landing kind of thing. Like it's, it's, it's this kind of like historical moment, the last few months that we can see these works working, working, not, not videos of them. Um, and I wonder, you know, how we're gonna look back uh, in a few years to you know the fall of 2020 which is many many other things but also the last I guess semester that um, elite folks were able to to teach it live yeah, yeah I mean it's gonna make our jobs so much harder right <laughs> I mean we were thinking when when trying to to pick pieces right that would work with the theory that we were trying to to sort of um, illustrate uh, we, we were just kind of afraid. I mean, I, I'm thinking of all the elite classes that I've taught in the past and my favorite works and what's going to happen? What am I going to teach? I'm going to teach just pure ephemera. And I mean, there's something quite interesting and poetic in itself about it, but it is just this, this, the end. Let's just hope the world doesn't end actually by 2020 <laughs> or the end of right. it, honestly. But this, this is actually- back oh. to the materials too. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the same to watch um, a flash piece in video mm -hmm. where you can, you know, pause it and rewind it or fast forward it uh, versus seeing it run and mm -hmm. the affordances are totally different. I mean, even the ones that just run like Dakota or like, um, oh, let's stay with that before I blank out on another example, uh, but the ones that just run from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even those that would sort of lend themselves a little bit better to uh, seeing them in video format, a recording of them, you mm -hmm. lose that kind of like the only way to stop this is you have to close the window. Mm -hmm. yeah. Versus you can actually pause it and fast yeah. forward, um, rewind. And you know how that. long it lasts. I mean, whenever I yes. read the Young mm -hmm. He Chang Heavy Industries piece, it's a lot less stressful now that they've ported them into video, yes. I, can pause it. I, can, I can, you know, check my phone yeah. before you There's didn't know how long you were in for it. Exactly. You, know, you could like, be there for a half hour. Yeah. 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 Project for the expectations. Mm -hmm. 11 minutes, yeah. eight minutes, mm -hmm. and you can't look away. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. when we go to a movie, see, we do this when we go to movies with subtitles, let's say, well, when we went to the movies, <sighs> I miss the movies. <laughs> anyway, but I mean, it's a sensory focusing chamber, right? You go, you sit there, you're watching the film, and if there's subtitles, all you have to do is look at the screen and look at the subtitles and, and put your phone on Do Not Disturb if you have any consideration or appreciation for the art of cinema, and, and, and there you focus. And that kind of focus, we don't get so much. Uh, right. Anymore. Um, Not right. screens. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, even just the fact that you're like, I'm going to go to the bathroom now because I'm not going to leave this room for the next two hours because I don't want to miss anything from the movie, mm -hmm. which is a completely different, you know, but it also comes, it's, it's a good way to talk about the next question that we had that is precisely looking at the relation between illit or digital literature arts and their dependence on external infrastructure not just something like flash but largely like connectivity networks or other material infrastructures you know big corporations you know uh, how do you think works of electronic literature relate to this connection and this dependence um, i mean one way to think about it will be the environmental impact of digital technologies right but another way of thinking about it maybe are is thinking of works that are built from materials produced by other folks, other technologies. And I'm not talking about flash, flash but maybe your conception of third electronic, um, third generation electronic literature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you think that, elect, what is the relation between electronic literature and those other, infra the, those other infrastructures, either yeah. because they're built by somebody else or because they exist in the world, right? I mean, it's such a material connection. Um, yeah. You know, uh, from a preservation point of view, well, first of all, we have to think about what are the dependencies, right? What, what infrastructure is needed for something to work? So for instance, uh, a software like HyperCard didn't just require a certain operating system. It required a specific kind of, of uh, microchip, right? Like the Intel microchips uh, mm -hmm. no longer work. It doesn't work even if you have the right kind of operating system. So any kind of technology, any kind of work of electronic literature is created in a computational environment, right? A set of dependencies. And that could go as deep as the hardware. It could be software. It could be network connectivity. It could be services that are out there that you then access, right? There's a ton of Twitter bots, for example, that reference online dictionaries right to query to request a particular uh, synonym or word or something so you have these services when those apis get closed or they change their protocol if you don't update it it breaks if you suddenly start charging maybe the artist doesn't want to pay for that service etc cetera, etc cetera. so you have a lot of each piece you have to think about what are its dependencies now and of course, that's the real challenge. As time passes, every time you, a, a piece created, say in 1999, for the web of that time, then let's say it's just straight up HTML, maybe a little JavaScript, right? And, and some images and maybe some audio files, right? That piece that we would think is, is fairly stable using open standards. Uh, think of Ana Maria Uribe's Ani Poemas right? Did you know that those have sound? I did. Yes. So, but the thing is when we go with a modern browser, mm -hmm. those sound files that are in the code that they should autoplay don't because mm -hmm. they are in obsolete formats that contemporary browsers do not recognize. Not only that, depending on the browser and, and, and this is one of the few things internet explorer is, is kind of good for, I guess it's now edge or something, but anyways, um, they're they were the best at backwards compatibility. They actually, it actually knows how to read the, the code of 20 years ago. And so for instance, some things like autoplay sound, is deprecated. Back when there was GeoCities and all of these different free services yeah. in MySpace, you'd go to a website and yeah. music would play, right? Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. I remember my MySpace page. I was so excited about my music on it. <laughs> that all went away. I mean, they, they uh, you know, they, they, they suspended that. And so, I mean, pop-up blockers, uh, damage pieces that require pop-ups, which was a fine convention until the, the evil forces of advertising uh, used it to hijack people's browsers and, you know, other malicious exploits. Frames, uh, 
are are bye bye, right? You can still kind of make it work, and they still know how to understand them, but they're not part of how we design websites nowadays. Mm -hmm. So the entire computational environment changes. So one strategy for preservation, and this will work with Flash. The problem is we have to burn some calories. We we have to we it, it's not accessible to the masses. But right now, one can request a virtual machine, say, running Windows XP. Uh, and you can take that Windows XP that comes with an out-of-the-box Internet Explorer that will run the, you know, say, uh, code from 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? XP is sort of a 2005, 2004, mm -hmm. right? So if you were to take that and go find yourself a vintage flash player and install it in that virtual operating system, then in that virtual machine, you could see flash, right? So mm -hmm. flash isn't gone. It's just that the computational environment no longer supports it in a massive way. And mm -hmm. therefore, you know, it's, it, people won't burn those calories go through those extra steps to be able to access those works. Right. But specialists I mean, who want to study it will be able to do it. I think part of the challenge is we need to, we need to archive everything, like entire operating systems, entire software libraries with all the versions and all the updates. We need to save everything so that then we can access these things and study them. And I, I think Library of Congress and National Archives and all of these, I, I, I think our government needs to do better uh, and, and request and demand that companies such as Adobe, uh, you know, as mm -hmm. they close out something like Flash, that they make available the file specifications and and make that which is closed source more open so that preservation efforts can happen if they're not going to do it. So I think these companies need to be held accountable. Um, and the only way to do this is government. You need the government to kind of force them to do it. So before, uh, yeah, I, that is a lot to think about. <laughs> and I guess our hopes for uh, those things happening lately are not super high. Um, uh, but it makes me think about something we were discussing before we started the recording, which is this, um, I, I guess to a certain extent we could consider it a dependency on, on the web itself and mm -hmm. how many more, um, how many more, um, should we call them platforms or just context, um, I wonder? Um, there are that are perhaps underutilized uh, in part because of the overhead to get started and the entry barriers and so on that we were discussing. I don't know if you wanted to, we stopped you when we were talking about that, but I don't know if you want to elaborate. Well, you know, uh, I think, and, and to kind of also answer that sort of neglected part of third generation electronic literature, I think the barrier to access that people have using you know, their pocket computer. Let's talk about what people have in their hands, right? Mm -hmm. These these are powerful pocket computers, right? Mm -hmm. That that we, you know, give us the ability to make videos, write on these videos, share those videos, to create images, to 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 do all kinds of sharing, to do all kinds of artistic digital writing, uh, whether our intent is literary or not. Right, and there, that's that's where we started start getting to some of the tricky parts of the concept of literature and and electronic literature, and then when we think of third generation electronic literature, because you have you have a ton of people using these kinds of easy access tools to create digital writing and to create mm -hmm. other things that are not writing, but amongst the things that they're creating, there's writing involved. Let's say memes, let's say TikTok videos, let's say, uh, you know, 
tweets and, and Facebook posts that have certain design elements, um, uh, things that allow you to create simple animations and share them. Uh, it's training people to do a kind of writing that goes beyond the page, right? Static sequences of text ink on paper, right? And, and when you suddenly start doing something that generates or that is multimedia by design or that incorporates the passage of time, a GIF, right? That is looping and including some text in it or that the text itself is being animated throughout the GIF. And then you put that out in circulation and people are inspired and it becomes a meme and they start adding and doing their own thing their intent may not be literary. They may not be thinking, I'm here to create art. Capital L literature, right? <laughs> Dress up, yes. to create some literature. I'm gonna write some literature. But, <laughs> but, but you're still communicating with writing in artistic mm -hmm. ways, right? You are very close to literature. And so mm -hmm. I think when you have massive amounts of people doing that habitually, growing up with that as a kind of fun natural thing they will at some point grow up and say someday they might have a, a a sort of expressive literary poetic impulse and they may create you know a gif that really moves people that really is or a video poem or a lyric video right that's one of the really vibrant spaces youtube there's so much creative writing going on on video mm -hmm. right so so i mean people will create things that are really powerful and they already are and so i think i think we're very close to a very overt literary exploration of this in which people are in a kind of serious way really trying to do something artistic uh right so, but in the meantime, I think we need to have some fun, right? This is the pop culture of electronic literature. And yeah. not everyone who writes is writing in a literary way, but every word that people are writing is preparing them to be better writers and to potentially write a, a great novel or a great poem or a great story or a great screenplay or a great video game or a great video poem or a great GIF or a great bot. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's all preparation for it. Yeah. And this takes us to the last question that, that we have. And, um, cause we don't want to take too much of your time, just, just enough. Um, and I wonder if this, this, even this idea that you, that you're proposing of, you know, this is the pop culture of elite. Uh, I wonder also what the dimension of the economical impact or the economical dimension is. And, and I mean, I guess because electronic literature tends to be more of a niche and experimental and associated to uh, academic circles, there seems to be a disconnection or a misunderstanding of how elite participates in or around industries like publishing, like software mm -hmm. development, uh, app stores, uh, you know, uh, creative content creation, etc. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the, this, these economies that surround elite that really, I think, have never been fully consolidated. And, that, and that's, I mean, that's an important aspect also of how it works in the, in the material world of, you know, uh, yeah. importation of uh, minerals and um, <laughs> manufacturing of things and so on. You know, even in the book world, right the 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 dream and I, I suppose this is capitalism right but but few writers get to live from writing alone right and even so i mean so so writers frequently poets uh, novelists whatever need need day jobs need you know uh there's creative writing programs that 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 house a lot of writers and they're able to share their craft as they continue to produce. And that's great. Um, you know, some people reach the certain threshold where they are able to live off of what they do. 
uh, as as writers. And and I think that's part of what's missing in electronic literature. I mean, if you are producing at a high level, you are able to then get the academic job that then is able to maintain you. So so there's electronic literature has developed very well in that academic and creative environment. Uh, however, I think the prospects for commercialization, I think in part because electronic literature really emerged as a concept and a field, especially second generation, which is really the, the sort of core concept of electronic literature, developed concurrently with the web. It meant that it came along with this gift economy of the web, um, with this sort of openness, this giveaway, right? And all of our electronic literature collections are open source and free access. And, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. And, and that's the kind of organization that we are. And I don't think that will ever change. However, we haven't really developed markets. I think, you know, Eastgate Systems uh, was able to develop a market for hypertext. And I think that market for hypertext was hurt by the development of, of, of a sort of open and free web. And even though it may come to produce things for iPads, versions of their programs for iPads and all that, I, you know, I, I don't know that it will continue to, to be able to be a viable kind of market. It, I think at its best, it was still sort of a niche kind of small press publisher anyways. So even Michael Joyce, right, uh, who wrote Afternoon, I don't think he was going to live off of afternoon, you know, like it's so, so I think, I think we need a path, right? And one of the things we're seeing with what I call third generation ELIT is that people are creating pieces that go viral, that are supported through crowdfunding, that are supported through app sales, that are supported in ways that, that are not the academic uh, economy, mm -hmm. uh, the prestige economy, right? I know that the art scene is also home to a lot of electronic literature right. and really uh, folks like Young Hee Chang Heavy Industries, right? Mark Voge and Young Hee Chang, right, right, they don't, right. they move in the art mm -hmm. world, the art scene. Mm -hmm. And and that has its own gallery funding, royalties kind of economy, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the two primary economies where the digital language arts, uh, ex, ex, you know, happen. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, I, I think we're, I think these contemporary platforms like Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, uh, you know, iOS, Android, they come with markets, they come with market potentials. And I think in exploring them, we are exploring the profession of elite writer mm -hmm. uh, in the way that the publishing industry created the profession of writer, mm -hmm. which in most cases is aspirational. Most people <laughs> don't get to be Stephen King or Anne Rice, but, you know, but the fact that it's there becomes a, a goal, becomes mm -hmm. an aspiration. Kids growing up say, when I grow up, I want to be a writer or an astronaut or whatever. And, and, you know, they might read Writer it. and astronaut. I don't know how many kids. Look, yeah, that's what I used to say, writer or astronaut. And I think space is out at uh, this point, but writer, uh, you know, I write. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, so, so I would say, I would say we need to keep exploring these possibilities and, and that's where that publication initiative that I was talking about earlier uh, may come in handy. Um, and students, by the time this goes live, I think the other thing will be live. So you'll know what we're talking about and Alex will <laughs> hook you up to that. But for now, we'll keep it as our little secret. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds good. And it's a, it's a great way to to end this fabulous conversation. Thank you so much, Leo. And we will share this. And if we have any comments that come from it, we'll share them with you. That's okay. 
Oh, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you both. Uh, and I envy your students. They're in for a treat. <laughs> they have the two of you uh, oh, to guide them so through much. a wonderful exploration. So have a great semester and I'm at your service. Thank you. Thank Leo. you so much. Thanks. Bye bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye.